It's really great to see uh, all of you guys here for these important topics. Um, I am very much appreciative of the uh, MSA here who um, several years now they have um, had this topic of domestic violence. And so it tells me a couple of things about all of you as a student body, that one, you're aware of the issues, two, you have the courage um, to address issues that have historically been taboo in our community, and three, um, you guys are the kind of people that want to make a difference in this world, and that's good, and that makes me feel really good to be with you here. And I, you know, as I see the room filling up, it's just, um, it feels good to see so many people recognizing that this is an important issue. Uh, both of the issues that we're going to talk about today, actually. So I've been asked to speak about domestic violence. And um, just so that we're all on the same page, um, domestic violence is a form of oppression. There's lots of kinds of oppression in this world. Domestic violence is one of them. And there are lots of other names for domestic violence. You might hear the term intimate partner violence, which is um, the kind of violence that occurs between um, either spouses or people in a dating relationship, uh, hence getting intimate partner violence. Domestic violence is a broader category. It includes uh, violence that happens in the home between any person who is trying to dominate or have control over another person. And there are lots of ways, lots of tactics that people use to control another person. And so um, we look at in order to determine if it's domestic violence, we look at if it's a pattern of behavior. It's not like one incident that happened that's violent, but it's a pattern that shows that one person is trying to control uh, the other person. Um, you may also hear terms like family abuse, um, intimate partner uh, terrorism, because it can feel like you're being terrorized if you're living in a home where there's this kind of violence. Um, the topic of today, you know, in terms of being called the elephant in the room, is extremely appropriate when we're talking about domestic violence because it, it, it is in this room. It's in every room. Um, if we look at the stats, um, this is, these are uh, from a survey that Peaceful Families Project did in 2011 in conjunction with Project Sakina. It's an online survey, and as far as I know, it's the largest uh, survey to date in the Muslim community. We had 801 respondents. And the people who responded to this survey are highly educated, mostly women, um, and high uh, level of income. So we're, we're talking about the upper level of our community. Um, and I'm emphasizing that for two reasons. One, a lot of people think that domestic violence only happens among poor, uneducated women. Uh, another th reason I'm saying that is because when we want to when we want to look at prevalence and statistics, we have to make sure we have a good sample, and this sample is just one segment of our community. Uh, we have yet to sample uh, people who are not English speaking, not computer literate, um, uh, don't have access to the um, uh, to the computer, lower and lower uh, economic uh, status. So. This is just part of the picture, it's not the whole picture. And from this picture, what we know is that a significant number of people, or half of the people, responded that they have experienced some kind of violence in their family at some point in their life. So if you think about that, that would be like every other person in this room. Okay, so it's definitely in this room, and it's not something that we talk about very often. Um, I think more than 70% of the people said they knew somebody who had experienced domestic violence. So let me get a show of hands, not about yourselves, but how many of you know somebody else who has experienced some kind of violence in their family or in an intimate partner relationship? <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Guys, too. Um, it just affects men and women. Um, um, a perpetrator of abuse could be anybody. Anybody who has power. And in, in different contexts, that person is different. In most of our families uh, that are immigrant families, 
the person who has the most power is the uh, male in the family, the, the husband or the father. In some of our families, the person who has power could be the mother or the mother-in-law. Uh, it could be uh, the elder in the family. In some of our immigrant families, the person with the most power is the teenage child who speaks English and the parents don't speak any English. So then that person is the one with power. Whoever has power is the one that is at risk for abusing that power. So they're, they're the ones who could be a perpetrator. If you think about it, the person who is weak and vulnerable is not likely to be able to abuse the other person because they're weak and vulnerable, right, so by definition. Um, the victim could also be anybody. But generally, because in our families, women and children tend to be more vulnerable, they are the ones that are at greater risk. Um, and what we know from the statistics, uh, the Centers for Disease Control um, completed their survey, um, 2011, I believe, also, that one in seven men and one in four women at some point in their life will, will have experienced some kind of abuse in their family. The picture is a little bit different for men and women. So for men, they're most likely to have experienced abuse as boys, and that could be any form of abuse. And if you think about it, that makes sense because that's when they're most vulnerable. For women, it's more across the, life, the lifespan. So women are the ones in some cultures who are, you know, when, when they are, have a female baby born, there are still cultures that bury girls alive or that kill, uh, that kill infant children who are girls or who abort uh, a fetus if it's female. So that's still happening. And the, and the types of abuse that occur across the lifespan are uh, much more uh, prevalent for women than for men. But regardless, um, it's important that we address all forms of violence against everybody and try to interrupt that. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the different kinds of violence. The most obvious kind of violence is the physical abuse. And that's because we can see it. We can see the bruises. We can, we can see when somebody is pulling somebody's hair or pushing or shoving. So that one is really easy to detect. Um, it is also, unfortunately, relatively common among the forms of abuse. Um, sometimes it can get to the point of uh, severe injury. I've worked with many people who have been hospitalized as a result of physical violence um, from a, a spouse, typically the husband, um, where a weapon, a weapon has been used or simply uh, being hit so forcefully that ribs are broken or arms are broken, and I've, you know, I've witnessed this, and it's unfortunately happening in many of our homes. Uh, the most common form of violence is the verbal abuse, and we often don't think of it as violence. It's just a word. It's just a name. How did it hurt you? But for those of you who have experienced being uh, attacked verbally or insulted verbally, you know how um, much that hurts, and you know how long the pain lasts. And many people who have been in abusive relationships actually feel like they recover from the broken bones or the bruises, but that the words have never um, left them. They continue to suffer from those. And, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about and prevents, prohibits uh, verbal abuse. In, in all of its forms, in Surah Al-Qajarat, and that's the, um, the verse that I have up there. Uh, other forms of abuse, and I'm just gonna kind of go through these quickly so that you're aware of them. Psychological abuse is probably the hardest to detect because you can't see it. It can be done very, um, even silently, quietly, um, and so it's hard sometimes to even realize if you're being abused psychologically, and sometimes if you're trying to tell somebody that you're being abused, um, you, you feel like you don't have any con anything concrete to grab onto. You can't, you can't like point to a bruise. You can't say, well, the person called me a name and said X, Y, Z. But you can feel it because you're feeling intimidated. And that's because somebody is threatening you or isolating you or um, in some way uh, affecting your level of feeling safe in the relationship. It could be accusing you. Even simply, you know, like for many women, being a Muslim woman, being accused of uh, being loose or promiscuous is a big deal. And that can sometimes be enough of a threat to control her behavior. It doesn't even have to be um, a physical uh, violence. But the effect on the um, person's uh, spirit is 
just as bad as having hit that person. So we shouldn't minimize the psychological abuse. Um, financial abuse and spiritual abuse. Spiritual abuse is also unfortunately very common, not only in our community, but in all communities of faith. And that has to do with um, the abusive person using, the, using or rather misusing religious teachings to try to control the other person's behavior. So for example, it, it, and this is probably common in your age group, a parent, um, obviously we are taught to obey our parents. And it is part of being a righteous Muslim to obey your parents and to be, uh, to engage in bid or righteousness towards your parents. Sometimes the parent will use that kind of obedience card to pressure somebody to marry a person that they don't really want to marry. And that is a misuse of an Islamic teaching, which is yes, we're supposed to obey our parents. However, we are supposed to have the freedom to choose who we want to marry. And so you can see where um, the religious teaching can kind of be used in a way to control or manipulate. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the forced marriage uh, later. <coughs> but any kind of interference with a person's religious practice, whether it's forcing you to do something or not allowing you to do something that you want to do. Because we know that Allah subhanahu wa has given us a choice in everything. He's told us the right way, and he's told us what's the wrong way, and then he gives us the freedom to choose. So we as human beings don't have the right to force somebody when Allah subhanahu wa himself has given that, that freedom. Um, so a lot of times people want to know, okay, so why are people violent? Like, why does this thing even exist? Why is it so common? And the truth is, it's a learned behavior. So when people grow up seeing it and it's normalized, or when it happens in communities and nobody speaks up against it, and it's just kind of accepted, people just copy it. If you grow up in a home where that's the model, um, you are also at more risk for doing that in your relationships. It doesn't mean that you will be abusive just because your parents were abusive, but you're at much greater risk. Unless you decide that you want to do it differently, but most people just kind of run their life on automatic pilot. So they just kind of copy whatever they grew up with without really engaging themselves in critical thinking and trying to stop. It's also all around us. Um, if you watch movies, if you watch TV, if you watch mu music videos, um, if you walk somewhere in public, you are going to experience, witness violence around you. A lot of times we just kind of tune it out. We don't even notice it. You're in the grocery store and some you know, mom is yanking her kid or insulting her kid. And we just kind of like shrug our shoulders and look the other way. But that's a kind of abuse as well. The kinds of abuses that might be common on college campuses, and I know for a fact um, on this campus, uh, because I've, um, I've spoken with um, some of the people in the counseling center here, I've been to the campus, um, at different times um, to talk to some of the counselors as well as uh, students. So I know that um, on this campus, like many other campuses across the country, um, many of you are in dating relationships. And that's another taboo that we don't talk about because we're not supposed to date. But the fact is people are in dating relationships. And in those dating relationships, there's often a lot of violence. And one of the psychological kinds of abuse that happens is because both parties know that it's not an acceptable relationship, it's a haram relationship, one person can use that against the other person. So they'll say, if you don't do what I want, then I'm going to tell your parents or whoever it is that matters to you that you're in this relationship. So then that becomes abusive. And it's important that we don't get stuck on the fact that somebody's in a you know, um, in a haram relationship or, or uh, unacceptable relationship and ignore the fact that there's violence. If there's violence, we have to stop the violence. Um, and, you know, it's not really right to blame somebody and say to them, and this, is, this happens a lot, to say to them, well, if you, didn't, if you didn't get yourself into this haram relationship, you wouldn't be abused. Um, the abuse is wrong and the relationship may also be wrong. And it's important that we address both, both of those pieces. Um, there's a lot of stalking that happens, um, whether it's cyber stalking or in-person stalking, a lot of sexting. Um, people get into relationships, and particularly women, I think, are vulnerable to getting into a relationship prematurely or with the wrong person 
Because at this age, there's a lot of pressure. Your parents want you to get married. There's also a lot of pressure because probably everybody else that you know is in some kind of a dating relationship. And it's natural to want to be in a relationship. But unfortunately, I think many people at your age, and I was probably the same at your age, there's not really much guidance in terms of what to look for in a relationship and how to know if you're in a healthy relationship or an unhealthy one. And so I think a lot of times it just feels good to be in a relationship, and girls especially will overlook um, the kinds of behaviors that are controlling and that really are red flags for um, full-blown abusive relationships. And then, because they don't, you know, they feel bad that they're in this relationship in the first place, they may not tell anybody that they're being abused. They may feel kind of stuck. Um, and if they engage in behavior that's not appropriate um, because they're not married to the person, but they've crossed those lines, they've engaged in some sexual behavior, which is also very common, um, then they may feel like they have to marry this person. Okay? And so if it's an abusive relationship, and now they feel like, oh, i got to marry this person anyway, even though it's abusive, um, unfortunately, they just kind of set themselves up for a lifetime of abuse. I also see, um, as a result of those kinds of relationships, there, there are abortions that are um, happening, unfortunately, and people, um, again, they resort to that because they feel like they're kind of stuck. Um, okay, next slide. So what's the big deal about abuse, right? Like, why is it such a big deal? So the guy hits you or pushes you and you get over it, uh, it's just a few bad words. You know that you're not really stupid or lazy or whatever he called you. Get over it. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. Whether the victim is male or female, the, the, the impact of the abuse can be really long term. For physical violence, we, like I mentioned, there are broken bones, there's bruises, there's concussions, and there are fatalities. People do actually get killed. And in our community, there have been several fatalities. Although it's not public knowledge that it was a result of domestic violence, um, there have been several cases where there's been fatalities. Um, also, when you're, in an, when you're in an abusive relationship, that puts a huge stress on you. It's a huge strain on you. And when we're under chronic stress, we tend to get sick a lot. So people who are in abusive relationships also tend to develop chronic illnesses. There's a whole you know, body of research that looks at the toll in dollars on the American workforce because people have to miss work because of court costs, because of medical uh, visits. Um, people in, a, in domestic uh, violence relationships are also at a greater risk of becoming homeless because sometimes the abuse gets so bad, you just leave and you may not have anywhere to go. And so people could be homeless. Um, poverty as well. People may leave because they can't stand to be in that relationship anymore, but they may not have the ability to support themselves. So there, there are lots of um, also long-term psychological uh, impacts, psychological damage. Um, domestic violence can cause post-traumatic stress disorder, just the same as people who are fighting in a war get post-traumatic stress disorder. So do people who are living in, a, in an abusive relationship. Excellent. I want to talk a little bit about abuse on kids. Not that any of you are children right now, but some of you may have been children in abusive relationships. And many of you, inshallah, will have children. So it's really important that you understand that when a child is growing up in a home where there's violence between the parents, that child is at increased risk of being abused directly, or they get caught in a crossfire. Many children will try to protect their mother if the father is being abusive. And so if you imagine a little, you know, a little five-year-old or a little three-year-old trying to get in between two adults and one of these adults is violent. So many children actually get injured, they go to the hospital. Um, again, the public story isn't that there's domestic violence, the story would be, oh, they fell down the stairs or they fell off their high chair or whatever it is. But we know that many of these children are injured, are injured because the parents are, are fighting. There are also psychological uh, implications. So many of the people who are in um, the juvenile uh, justice system have come from homes where there's domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Many of the criminals in our society have come from homes where there's domestic violence. People join gangs, people turn to drugs, people get into um, uh, high-risk relationships as a way to kind of cope 
when they're when they're dealing with violence at home. So these are like really big deals. Um, and not to minimize or take away from what I was just talking about in terms of implications, but to me, as a Muslim, one of the most serious implications, and this is where I think we're, we're all really responsible, is the spiritual implications. Because when people are in an abusive relationship, they often have a spiritual crisis. And many people turn away from Islam altogether, they turn away from God altogether, because they feel like um, nobody's listening, nobody's helping, nobody's Know, protecting them. Um, people will ask the question, you know, why is Allah allowing this to happen to me? Am I a bad Muslim? Is he mad at me? Am I just, you know, I don't deserve anything better? Um, am I being punished? So these are, you know, questions that indicate a spiritual crisis. And because in our community, um, it's difficult for people to come forward, or when they do come forward, they're usually blamed, and people will tell them, well, probably you're not really a good enough Muslim, or you wouldn't be experiencing this. Or you probably don't have strong enough iman, you don't have strong enough faith, or maybe you're not a good enough wife, or you're not a good enough daughter, um, and that's why you're being treated this way. So because our response as a community reinforces um, that, that there must be something wrong with that person, and it's linked with Islam, that kind of uh, exacerbates any spiritual crisis. So we're going to talk now a little bit about the Islamic perspective. And Islam is it's a beautiful religion. I mean, it's cool. And it's a preventive model. And it provides us with the very clear teachings and very clear values and guidance to how to have a healthy relationship. And so it's really important that we, we all of us, all of you and all of us, study what Islam says about relationships. Read the Qur'an, don't take anybody else's word for it, don't take my word for it, open the Qur'an, read the verses, and ask yourselves, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want from you when you're in a relationship? And what does he want for you when you're in a relationship? And it's important that when you read the Qur'an and you study the Hadith, that you separate what you might have grown up with, because a lot of what we've experienced is cultural. It's not Islamic, even though people may label it as Islamic. And the only way you're going to know that is if you know what Islam says. So I have, um, I have several slides here with ayahs, and I'm not going to spend too much time on them, but I just want to alert your attention. And my hope is that you will go back and study these ayahs. The first one is an ayah which I hope all of you are familiar with, but it really emphasizes the inherent equality, the equal nature of men and women, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he created us from a single soul, in nafsin wahida. Okay? He didn't cre create men from you know, gold and women from silver. We're all created from nafsin wahida. And he talks about, in this ayah, um, uh, the importance of how to treat women. Because when he says, um, uh, sorry, um, when he says to reverence the wombs that for you, who has a womb? Women. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering us to revere and reverence women. Okay? So anybody who thinks that Islam puts women down, this ayah by itself is enough to destroy that idea. Next slide. Um, the other thing that's really important is that in Islam, it's very clear that men and women are different. And they're not different by accident, they're different by design. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. It's one of his signs that he says he created us as a male and a female. And he did that for a reason. And the reason is so that way we might get to know one another. Not that we may hurt one another or abuse one another, but so that we can know one another. And so if you're in a, in a marriage or you're getting to know somebody for the purpose of marriage, it's really important that you get to know each other as um, a male and a female and that you, you appreciate the differences that are there because they were put in us as one of Allah's signs. Um, 
in terms of how are men and women supposed to relate to each other. Uh, this ayah talks about believing men and believing women. Okay, not husbands and wives. Believing men and believing women. So that's, inshallah, everybody in this room. And he describes the relationship as awliya, ba'dhum li ba'd. So we are friends and protectors one of another. Okay, isn't that really a nice description? Think about that. So it doesn't, you know, it probably doesn't happen on this campus. When I was, when I was uh, a student in Indiana, um, the Muslim men would see a Muslim woman and look the other way. <laughs> And um, that didn't really match what is in the Quran. We're supposed to be able to work together the way that you guys are working together to have these kinds of events. You're working as partners. Because Al Quran says that by definition, this awliya, this friendship, this, this mutual protecting, he defines it as ya'muruna bin ma'ruf wa yanhawna al munkar, enjoining good and forbidding evil. So doing good things, that is the relationship, working as partners. Then when we come to marriage, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also doesn't leave it up to our imagination to figure out how we're supposed to treat each other. But he makes it very clear that he, he um, places in our hearts mawadda and rahma, love and compassion and mercy. And the purpose of that relationship is itaskunu ilayha, so that you would find tranquility in each other. Okay, it's mutual. And I want to emphasize that. It is for both men and women to find tranquility, peace in each other, okay? And if you think about it, if you're in a relationship where somebody is intimidating you, where somebody's threatening you, where somebody is physically hurting you, does that fit with the description of this ayat? Does it fit? Did I lose you guys? Are you sleeping? Does it fit? Okay, so that's an important way for you to assess the kind of relationship that you're in. Okay? Because if you're married and you marry according to the Islamic marriage contract, then you've agreed to marry each other according to the Quran and the Sunnah. And there's nothing in the Quran and the Sunnah that says you are, that you should engage in or accept any kind of abuse. Uh, next slide. Okay, very quickly, um, you know, how we should live with one another. Um, this ayah, the first ayah is addressed to men. And most of the ayahs in terms of how people should treat one another in, in between genders, these ayahs are addressed to men. And they're addressed to men because men are the ones, as leaders in the home, that have the power, and when they have the power, they are at risk for abusing that power. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has frequent reminders, and one of them is live with them on a footing of kindness. Now in English, you can't really, uh, you may not be able to tell, depending on the translation, that this ayah is addressed to men, and he's also is telling men to live with women on a footing of kindness and equity, okay? Because the pronouns in Arabic indicate that. Um, the other thing that's really important in terms of how we relate to each other is that we have to practice shura, which is mutual consultation. So again, the model for our relationships is it's mutual, everybody's voice gets included, and there is no such thing in Islam as somebody being a dictator and everybody else, you know, cowering in fear and just doing, you know, like this sort of absolute obedience kind of thing. Okay, next slide. And just because there are so many beautiful references in the Quran, I included another one, which is that men and women are garments for one another. And that's really a topic I could spend a whole hour on, what it means. But just think about what your clothes do for you and how, if you were a garment for another person, what that would look like. And if that person were a garment for you, what that would look like. Okay. Next slide. Here's an abused verse. Okay? It's that any, anybody could be abused, anything can be abused, even the Quran can be abused. And this verse, you know, many people, um, unfortunately, look at this verse and they think that, oh, this is where Islam says it's all right for men to hit their wives. Not only it's all right, my 
gosh, it's in the Quran, they have to with their wives. Okay? And I can tell you when I do presentations for uh, groups of non-Muslims, if I don't mention this voice, somebody will raise their hand and say, doesn't the Quran say that men can hit their wives? So I include it in every presentation about Islam. Mm. Because we need to be very proactive in making sure people understand the Quran in the right way. And I want all of you to understand it in the right way. Um, I'm going to do this very quickly, but I do encourage you to research not only this verse, but all of the verses so that you have a proper understanding. And again, you're not taking my word for it. But this verse outlines the, relationships, the relationship between men and women in the family, where men are given the responsibility of being qawamun. They are the ones who are upright. They're the ones who support the family. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defines why they have this role as qawamun, because they support women financially. And this is where we know, how we know, that it's men's responsibility to provide financially, and women do not have that responsibility in the family. So it's a responsibility. It's not a right. And um, this word qawamun is the same, it comes from the same root as when we say qadqamat salah. It's something that's being established and it's upright and it's good. There's nothing in this word that, that um, has a meaning of dictatorship or oppression. Um, then there's the definition of a righteous woman. Okay? In some of the translations I've seen, this, this um, where it says that the righteous women are devoutly obedient, sometimes in parentheses it says to their husbands. But in actuality, this word is obedience to Allah. And it's used for both men and women who, who are obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's really important. And the whole, the whole structure of the family, in terms, in terms of the husband having this leadership role, the wife and the husband, both of them, being obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the accountability is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So all of the whole framework is always in the context of our relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when a husband is leading the family, he should be leading the family towards good and in the way that the Prophet ﷺ modeled, which if any of you um, are familiar with the way the Prophet ﷺ lived, he was gentle, he was kind, and he never used force or um, you know, oppression on anybody. The final piece of the verse, and it, it does require much more in-depth uh, conversation, but just to go through lightly, that this is a specific um, situation that's addressed by this verse, a situation in which there is nushuz. And nushuz is a word that has a lot of interpretations, but generally it is something that is threatening the integrity of the marriage, okay? Um, and in that case, there is a three-step process that is outlined, and this is a restrictive process, not prescriptive, it's not a prescription, but it's restrictive, because if you know about the time of Jahiziyyah before Islam, women were, um, if, if a man was angry with his wife, he could kill her, he could throw her out, he could you know, treat her in any which way. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands men here, when there's a serious problem, first talk to your wife, that sounds pretty common sense to us now, but that was pretty revolutionary. And talk to your wife uh, to show her how serious it is. You can separate uh, in bed. And then finally, this last phase, which is what we want. And I left it in Arabic because there are different interpretations for it. Okay? When we try to understand the Quran, we look at the example of the Prophet. And we know from his example that he never, he never, raised a hand against a woman or a child. Even when he had some serious marital issues, did you know that the Prophet has marital issues? Did you guys know that? When he had serious marital issues, he never resorted to using his hand. Um, so finally, um, the next slide, just to summar summarize, uh, the Quran violates, the, the um, abusive behavior violates the Quranic injunctions of how we have to treat each other with compassion, with justice, and respect. And abusive behavior contradicts very explicitly the model of the Prophet Muhammad. 
So it's completely forbidden in Islam. So on college campuses, on college campuses, what can you do to prevent or end domestic violence? Um, first and foremost, whatever you've learned today, if you've learned anything, share it with somebody else. Just share it. Um, there's re we have resources on the table outside. Grab a brochure, give it to somebody. It, um, you can learn the domestic violence hotline, 1-800-799-SAFE. Uh, Memorize it. Tell it to somebody who needs it. Um, when you see violence occurring, do something. Speak up about it. Say it's wrong. If you're experiencing it, you can also say, I don't accept this kind of behavior. You, you can try to set limits. If that doesn't work, go and get help. If that doesn't work, get out of the relationship. Okay? Nobody deserves to be in an abusive relationship. No one at all. And as Muslims, we know that um, when we see something wrong, whoever among you sees something that's evil, and believe me, domestic violence is evil, the first step is you should change it with what? with your hand. So that means intervening, right? It doesn't mean go beat the guy up, it means intervening. Um, and if you can't do that for whatever reason, then what? Speak. speak. All of us can speak. All of us can say this is wrong. And if you can't do that because maybe you're going to be uh, hurt as a result, maybe the abusive person will injure you if you speak up, at least, what's the last thing? In your heart, at least say to yourself, this is wrong. I know this is wrong. So I'll stop here and then we'll, we'll take questions I think later at the next, uh, after the next.